Have you been thinking about putting your money into Scarlet and Violet booster boxes because Sword and Shield prices are just too high? Well, in today's video, I'll be telling you the truth about investing in Scarlet and Violet and why I think you won't be able to make as much profit from this generation of booster boxes. Let's get straight into it. Hey guys, it's Pokemonster here back with another video. Welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, we are talking about the general investability of the Scarlet and Violet era. Now, this video will apply to you whether you are an English collector or a Japanese collector. And make sure you stick around till the end because I'll be giving you some tips about how to get around this problem. Now, with Pokemon Sword and Shield, especially English booster boxes, exploding in popularity in the last few months, people have naturally been talking about and discussing what's the next big investment. And as the generation that follows Sword and Shield, Scarlet and Violet is naturally going to be the type of product that most people put their eyes on, also because it is by far the most accessible. And before I get into the meat of this video, let me just put out a few disclaimers. I am not a hater of the Scarlet and Violet era. I love Scarlet and Violet era. I actually think it's a little bit underrated with all the illustration rares that come in the boxes and sets. So I do really like the artworks on Scarlet and Violet. This video is mainly focusing on the investability of the product. Furthermore, I just want to make clear that I'm not saying in this video that you shouldn't invest in SV at all. I'm just questioning the replicability of past success with investing in previous generations as opposed to this generation. What I'm saying in this video is that if you took the average Scarlet and Violet set and compared it to the average Sword and Shield booster box or Sun and Moon booster box, and you averaged out the growth over the same period of time, let's say three years or five years, I believe that Scarlet and Violet on average will give you lower returns than Sword and Shield and Sun and Moon. And there's only one word that I wanna talk about as to why I think this is the case. And that word is optimization. To start with, what I mean by optimization is that if you look at the Pokemon investing community five, 10 years ago versus what it is today, it is forcibly much bigger today. There are many more people covering topics about investing on the internet. Social media has proliferated even more. And what that means is that there are many more eyes on the newest products all the time. If you compare the situation now with Scarlet and Violet compared to five years ago. Everyone in the Pokemon community in 2024 has at least some degree of awareness of the potential investability of these products. And if you compare that to three to four years ago, just before the boom that was proliferated by Logan Paul, I would argue that much fewer people would have had the same level of awareness. So whilst people say that, you know, Pokemon has been going on for 25, 30 years and, you know, the past is always going to repeat itself, I believe that the circumstances are always changing. And in today's world, the investing community in Pokemon is much more optimized and already aware of the future growth potential of these products from the outset. And as my second point, if I'm comparing that to Sword and Shield and Sun and Moon, I would say that the Sword and Shield era was the last era where people were still a little bit doubtful about the investing potential of these products. That's why you are seeing only today, about two to three years after the Sword and Shield sets release, like Lost Origin, Fusion Strike, Brilliant Star, we are only seeing them starting to go up now. But I believe that when people are approaching Scarlet and Violet now, as I've said before, it's an extremely affordable product and people are much more aware of its potential. That means there are less likely to be people sleeping on the product. And when you have a lot of people doing the same thing, that means that the amount of returns that are available to any single person in that group of people is going to be lower than before. And if we're looking at Sun and Moon booster boxes, for example, let's look at tag team sets like Team Up, Unbroken Bonds, and Cosmic Eclipse. Those sets are basically four figure sets nowadays in US dollars, in particular Team Up. But the big difference between Team Up and Scarlet and Violet is that at the time that Team Up came out, no one predicted or imagined that it could have been a 2K set. Whereas now I think we have a greater awareness of the potential of modern booster boxes. And that means that people are likely to catch on to these things earlier. And what makes Team Up so expensive is that no one or very few people were buying it at the time as an investment, thinking it would go up to 2K versus the amount of people today who will be buying Twilight Masquerade cases or Temporal Forces cases in the hopes that they go up in the same way. 
And the next point that I would like to make about optimization, especially in the context of modern product, is the speed at which information travels. So whereas before, in previous releases, in previous generations, it might have taken some time for the full set lists and cards to come out. Nowadays, we know the full list of secret rares before the set is even out. That means that there are so many people providing you with investment analysis videos of the full set before the product even comes out. And if the product moves even 10 to $20, you have someone covering it on YouTube and saying that the product is booming. So that means that the community and a much wider audience of people are picking up on even the most minute changes in a single product. That doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some anomalies in a generation or things that people are sleeping on. Now, let me give you a personal example of what's happening now because of the amount of money that's going into Pokemon investing. So I bought this recently. As you can see, I got this very, very beautiful case of Pokemon Japanese 151. And you know, if you had a case of this kind of product like six to seven years ago, that would count like a big purchase, right? But now look at this picture that I'm gonna put on the screen of a random whale that's just bought like 50 to 60 cases of Pokemon 151. So even if I'm buying 12 boxes of this newest product, which is a hot product, 12 boxes wrapped in a sealed case, which in itself is a slightly rarer product than the booster box itself, that is still massively dwarfed by this one person, one example I'm showing you of someone who has 50 to 60 cases. Now imagine just how much product is out there of other people who have more cases than the guy that I just showed you the picture of. And then you start to get a picture of just how much product is out there, but also just how much money people are putting into this product for sealed investing purposes. What that means is if a product slightly starts to go up in price, there's gonna be a lot of people who actually have the product available to put for sale. And that's gonna cause a slightly depressing factor to long-term price increases because everyone is gonna to wanna to get in a little bit on the price increase, which means that actually the product itself is not rare. It's just that people are holding on to it until they see some sort of return on it. And then you'll start to see the market being flooded with that product. I also think that the concept of optimization is why we've seen some insane growth on some recent Sword and Shield sets. So in the Japanese side, you have EV Heroes and Blue Sky Stream, which are each over 300 pounds or close to 400 US dollars. And on the Sword and Shield side, you have Evolving Skies, which is now going for, I haven't even kept up with the latest update, but it's probably 600, 700 pounds almost like 800, 900 US dollars. Now, I don't know if the product is actually worth that much at the moment, as opposed to people speculating on its future growth potential. And what that means in the overall context of optimization is that people are pricing in their expectations of future growth into the current prices. So whilst it's very nice to have these prices now for Evolving Skies, I question what price it will go up to in two to three years, because that does still count to me as a product that there's so many people out there that have so much of it. If it goes up even more, I think we'll start seeing more product come out onto the market. And the final point that I wanna make about this concept of optimization is grading, right? Everyone is so much more attuned to the grading potential of cards that whenever you get a set coming out now in Japanese or in English, people are pulling the cards and preserving them in perfect condition and sending them straight off the PSA in grading. Now, this is a huge market change compared to what the position was three, four, five years ago, because now grading is much more accessible to everyone. There are so many middlemen out there and PSA have made the process easier for direct submissions to them. What that means is that there aren't really situations like the base set Charizard or the first edition base set Charizard, where so many people were playing around with the cards on the playground, which led to a condition rarity situation for them. We are not gonna get that with modern product anymore because there are so many people, including myself, who will be wanting to grade the cards that they pull straight out the bat. And obviously single prices do play a role in the long-term potential of a sealed product as well. 
that means that there might be a long-term negative effect on the price potential of the singles and therefore the price potential of the sealed product. So then how do we deal with this, right? Does it mean that we shouldn't invest in SV products at all? No, because firstly, I believe that most people who are investing are doing it partly because they like collecting the product. But the second thing that I wanna say is you should still do it if it's what you enjoy, but just manage your expectations as to the long-term growth of the product. So whereas Sword and Shield, you might be expecting a 50%, 80% increase in two to three years, maybe temper down your expectations a little bit for Scarlet and Violet. Because look at even the most popular Sword and Shield sets that came out two to three years ago. Fusion Strike and Brilliant Stars are still available on the Pokemon Center, despite all of the recent media, social media coverage about how they're exploding in price, how Sword and Shield is stonks, you can still get those products on the Pokemon Center. So if products as hot as those are still available on the Pokemon Center, what do you think the position is going to be like for SV products, even if they print a little bit less of it? The second one is obviously don't only invest in SV, because I think that social media and YouTube is so focused on the ultra modern products that a lot of the times people are missing out on previous generations. Now, I'm a victim of this myself because I'm mainly buying the newest sets as and when I can, but I'm sure that there are plenty of opportunities available, not just with vintage, but even slightly earlier generations like Sun and Moon. In my opinion, up till the end of last year or end of 2022, you could have still picked up some Sun and Moon booster boxes for relatively cheap compared to what they are today. So the next tip is to diversify your strategy and collecting a little bit. Don't put all your eggs in one basket with Scarlet and Violet. And the third tip, which is sort of related to managing your expectations, is let it marinate, right? Investing is about the long game and everyone has a slightly different investing time horizon. But if you are prepared to hold on to the product for a long period of time, then just sit on it, forget about it and let it marinate. Investing, obviously it's tied to collectibles, so we do get a little bit emotional about it. But if you're truly looking to invest, really, it should be something that you're buying and just putting away in your shelf and not really looking at for like a long period of time especially with Scarlet and Violet booster boxes. So if you're happy to do that, then just let it marinate. I mean, I have things in my collection that I bought in 2012 that are still here. Whilst Scarlet and Violet booster boxes might not offer you the same profit potential as Sword and Shield or previous generations, there is still plenty of money to be made in the long game. You just have to be a little bit patient and manage your expectations. Now, let me know in the comments, have you been picking up Scarlet and Violet booster boxes? What is your strategy? Let's all have a discussion about it. I'd love to hear from you guys. Thanks for watching. Now, don't forget to like, subscribe and comment to stay in tune for more Pokemon investing and collecting tips. Happy collecting.